My name's John Lakin. My family have been farming here since 1948. My wife and I moved back to the farm in 2010. We started grazing cattle, sheep and goats and we've set up our own Lakey Farm meat business. And what's following will be a little bit of how we graze and manage our farm. So initially I was born and raised on this farm but I went away for about two decades and worked as a winemaker around Australia. I had access to the non-arable country which is most of the, the untampered with native volcanic plains uh, soil on the farm. Our goal here was to start to do a little bit of grazing through the vineyard so we didn't have to do as many machine operations. We noticed that we had a huge problem with bent grass on most of this non-arable country. It's an invasive grass. It has, uh, it's palatable for about three months of the year, so the cattle get some advantage grazing it. But the rest of the time it dominates the pasture and doesn't allow any other grasses through. So I started looking at what else could we do and I became very jealous of people with substantial native grasslands, especially those with complex grasslands made up of five or six species at least of winter active um, and summer active grasses. 13, 14, I did a little bit of pasture topping. So we used the Roundup at 150 mils per hectare. Uh, and that was just enough to abort the flowering heads of the bent grass. So the grass remained palatable and this livestock grazed it down. The next strategy we'll approach will be to look at intensive cell grazing and increasing livestock numbers on the farm, but grazing them in smaller paddocks intensively. And even some of the paddocks that are 15, 10 or 15 acres, we might cut them in half and have 50 to 60 cattle and 100 sheep in that small area, four or five acres, and they'll be there for a day or two and trample the paddock, then we'll let the wires down, they can have the rest of the paddock. With cell grazing, you might have a, uh, two or three months rest between a paddock being grazed. So those paddocks can get an opportunity to climax each year and set seed before you bring cattle or, or livestock back in on them. Going back to 2014, the entire farm was burnt out. So we didn't lose the house and the yards, but we lost everything else. Uh, and in the regrowth that occurred across the farm, we saw a whole lot of native forbs that we'd never seen on the farm before. I had to go to the plant books and look them up because we had uh, chocolate lilies, bullbine lilies, we had um, milkmaids coming through. All these little plants turned up that I'd never seen in my time here on the farm. Along with the native grasses, and kangaroo grass, for example, a week after the fire, it had green shoots on it and was shooting, growing away. Completely adapted to the, to the environment it was in. Whereas a lot of our other grasses didn't come back for a long, long time. The next one that came out of the fire was microlina, uh, weeping grasses. Um, and they virtually dominated the farm. And that year, all the hay I fed out, I think the cattle just slept on it because they got fat on microlina. What we've found over the last probably two decades at least, is that rainfall patterns can shift remarkably. So you may not get your spring rainfall that you expect you get a surge of growth with. We are getting significant rainfall over summer in terms of big thunderstorms and big drops. Now, most of our pasture species have not been selected to take advantage of that. Most of the southeastern seaboard was dominated by, by summer grasses. And we see remnants of that. So these grasses were the only green pick in a paddock. And of course, they got grazed into the ground and eliminated from the system. Okay, well, well, I've got this um, grazing chart with all the days of the month and where your animals move to. And down the bottom, you record the rainfall from that month. So you add the rainfall from that month on and you subtract the rainfall from, from that month 12 months ago off. So you're just keeping a trend line. You're trying to guesstimate grazing capacity per 100 millers of rain what we'd start seeing is that 50 of those animals or 60 of those animals could be floating animals that could be good year animals. And then as I go into a dry year, I'd come back to my required grazing rate that I need for my business. So they start to push away the animals that are surplus and sell them off and you sell them early. And, and this is applying 
pretty good science that's been around now for a couple of decades to agricultural farming decisions. In the 60s, I think Syro went over to parts of Africa and parts of Europe where cattle occur naturally, and they brought over a marvellous little organism called the dung beetle, uh, which literally lives in the cow poo, I'll be polite, and, and they, they actually lay, they make a little ball and they dig a tunnel down into the ground and they, they'll bury the cow poo down underground. Now here on the basalt country, I think they struggle a bit because our soils can get very wet and to the point where they become anaerobic. Um, but some dung beetles survive every year and they come out and colonise. So with the dung beetles breaking the soil down or sometimes birds will come through and dig through the dung to get the dung beetles, they'll spread it right out. And that's one of the reasons the chickens are up the paddock. Is the idea is to bring enough chickens into the paddock that they can break up the poo clots and spread it out and let it re-fertilise the pasture. I'm not in a position to go and buy uh, native grass seeds at you know six, seven hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a kilo when I've got paddocks that can replenish themselves with a little bit of management. For me to try and sow pastures down on, on the farm here would have been impossible. So there wasn't really, in my mind's view, there was no other approach. And my approach also was the cheapest approach to regenerating pastures. Otherwise, I'd be up around $100, $150 a hectare to plant new pastures. What we also want to do is have complex pastures which create complex flavours in the animal itself. We've actually created a local meat brand, Lakey Farm, and we promote the fact that we're farming regeneratively and we're, we're looking to expand the, the number and volumes and acres of native grasses on the farm. And it's the one thing that we constantly get uh, mentioned at our farmers markets where people will tell us how they like the product. There's a lot of complex biology that's going on around them and there's a lot of insects that live in harmony with these grasses and species. Now, whether or not with a better management, you can actually start to regenerate these native grasslands and that's, that's where there's a big movement in Australian agriculture to try and do that. But on top of that, I think it'd be nice to start to respect the fact that we can manage a foreign agricultural system using native grasses, using native pastures, which is what was done here 200 years ago, I feel like. Trying to get more people, like this documentary is, trying to get more people aware of how food can be produced and how you can maintain a whole raft of ecological values, agricultural values, environmental values, all can be managed at the same time.